Good afternoon, all. And I'd like to reconvene the public hearing of the 31st meeting of the Joint Select Committee on National Security. This meeting is being broadcast live on Parliament Channel 11, Parliament Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, Paul View. I would like to welcome those present and also like to welcome the viewing and listening audience in public in Trinidad and Tobago and the world. As chairman, I would want to remind both the committee members and the officials that you will direct your questions and answers through the chair. I'd want to remind the members and the participants to activate your microphones before you begin to speak once you've been recognized by the chair. I want to welcome the members present, which include Divisional Commander, Eastern Division, Mr. Ryan Khan, Divisional Commander, Northern Division, Mr. Richard, Northern Division Central, Mr. Richard Smith, Divisional Commander, Northern Division North, Mr. Miguel Montrichard, Divisional Commander, Southern Division, Mr. Brian Sudin, Acting Superintendent, Southern Division, Mr. Nigel Birch, Assistant Superintendent, Northern Division North, Mr. Ishmael Pitt, Inspector, Eastern Division, Mr. Rishi Ragbir, and Mr. Terence Norbert. Superintendent North Central Division. Members, welcome. My name is Keith Scotland, and I am the chairman of this committee. I will invite now other members of the committee, starting with the vice chairman, Dr. Richards, to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, senior members of the TT Police Service. Paul Richards, vice chair. Good afternoon. I am Randall Mitchell, member. Good afternoon, all. I'm Ayana Webster Roy, member. Good afternoon, Rudal Munilal, member. Good afternoon, I'm Jayanti Lachmidial, member. Good afternoon, Richie Sukai, member. Thank you, members. I will <clears throat> now ask the divisional commanders to briefly introduce themselves. Afternoon, Chairman, Senior Superintendent, Khan Eastern Division. Good afternoon, Chair. I am Richard Smith, Senior Superintendent of Police in charge of North Central Division. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, afternoon, Senior Superintendent, Miguel Montrichard in charge of Northern Division North. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Brian Sudin, Acting Senior Superintendent of Police, Southern Division. Yes, the other officers, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm Superintendent Albert, attached to North Central Division. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Ishmael Pitt, Acting Assistant Superintendent, Northern North Division. Good afternoon, Chairman. Nigel Birch. Acting Superintendent, Southern Division. Good afternoon, Chairman. Rishi Ragbar, Inspector, Eastern Division. Ms. Crystal Gittin, Senior Parliamentary Research Specialist and Mr. Chad Salandi, Parliamentary Research Specialist. This session today revolves around an inquiry to gain an understanding of the anti-crime strategies implemented and being implemented to address criminal activity in Trinidad and Tobago. 
the objectives of this inquiry are to understand short, medium, and long-term strategies implemented by the TTS, the TTPS in this regard, to learn of specific measures engaged by the TTPS to ensure public <coughs> safety, to explore strategies to combat the open brazenness of criminality, and to establish approaches to combat the increasing incidence of school violence, and to consider measures implemented for improved detection. Divisional heads, I will ask you to give a brief opening remark, not exceeding two minutes, for the consideration of the committee and the general public. Chair. Sure. At Eastern Division, we have had some major successes over the last year. Our statistics will show that, that success. I will go on further when I have any question posed towards me in relation to anything that the, ch the Chair would like to know. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, as the Senior Superintendent North Central Division, I joined that division on the 26th of September, 2023. So this is making my sixth month in that division. Having joined that division, coming from the Southern Division, I, I observed the culture was quite different. The type of crimes committed in that division, um, it was quite different as compared to Southern Division, the prevalence of certain types of crime, as well as the culture of the officers, as well as the community, the residents, in that division was quite different. There are several challenges which, which I will outline as, when I get that opportunity to do, to do that. However, we have in fact um, instituted a lot of initiatives to assist in combating the type of crimes in this division. So when that time comes, I will um, elaborate on this. <coughs> Thank you. Well, good day to the chair and to the listening and um, viewing public. Um, as the Senior Superintendent, Northern Division North. Um, my focus, uh, because I'm of recent vintage, um, the 5th of January is when I joined the division, um, is still um, finding my feet with reference to the culture in the division and um, taking advice from the persons who are there for, for a period now and crafting together the strategies that are going to work in Northern Division North. We have had some success, and in due course, um, the figures will be reflected as the um, Inquiry goes on. Thank you. Good afternoon again, Chair. On assumption of the Office of Senior, Su Senior Superintendent Southern Division on the 5th of January this year, 2024, a review of the administrative and operational procedures were initiated so as to identify constraints and challenges affecting, affecting public safety and security in the division. Discussions were held with internal and external stakeholders through periodic meetings to ascertain <coughs> key information, empirical and scientific data highlighting particular crime trends in the Southern Division were also reviewed and analyzed accordingly, accordingly with the assistance of the copper branch of the TTPS. In, re in response to the increasing demands for public safety and security, measures by our key stakeholders, in particular the general population, a strategic and coordinated approach was mapped out con with, upon consultation with the First Division officers and other officers and other technical personnel from units and sections of the division. There are core challenges that we will discuss as we go, go along in the meeting with, with our strategies. Thank you very much. Before we begin the interrogation, I would just want to apprise the listening public that as to the rationale as to why you all were chosen, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Divisional Commanders, you all were selected because we wanted to bring before us the Divisional Commanders for the divisions with the highest crime to interrogate that 
and we wanted also to bring the divisional commanders from the divisions with the highest detection rate. So that is why you all were chosen, that is why you all were here. And as, I've, as I say that, let me go directly into the questions. Is there an urgency, divisional commanders, an urgency, a desperate urgency on the part of the police service to stem this, this crime that is going on in this country now? Is there a desperate urgency? I can get one, one person who can give us an answer and, and, and what, what drives, if it is so, what drives it? Mr. Chair, um, Senior Superintendent Smith from the North Central Division. Well, I will attempt to answer that question. Yes, there is in fact an urgency by members of the TTPS to stem this, this um, scourge of violent crimes that is plaguing us in the country at this stage. Um, we are in fact engaged in several initiatives as a um, TTPS on a whole and as divisional commanders individually in our divisions. What we also do in through our ComStat is we, we share information as to our successes our challenges, and we try to assist each other, each other in, this, in, this, in our initiatives. We also have interdivisional exercises so that we are able to identify suspects who are migrating from, other, from one division to the other committing crimes. Now, we understand that there's a serious problem as it relates to violent crimes. We also understand that we are the tail end of this entire process because when this, the family has failed, the home has failed, the school has failed, the, even the church has failed, they end up in, in our hands, the police service. And this is at the tail end where we have to either prosecute them, send them to counseling or otherwise. But we are in fact utilizing all resources, all our initiatives, all our strategies um, to combat this scourge of crime. And we will go on to some details as the, we go forward. Well, the, the time for the details now, huh? yes. not, there's no as we go forward. The, this is the question. The brazenness of the criminals, the brazenness, the no, no longer are uh, crimes being, serious violent crimes being committed under the, the cover of darkness. It's, it's now midday, we are seeing that. Yes. What is being done to stem that brazenness? We recognize the, the fact that they are being brazen. And the reason that they are being brazen is to send a clear message to possible witnesses. Don't come and say anything. Right? This is a challenge that we are having. What we are doing as a result of that, we have our gang units who are actively engaged in finding these persons who are responsible for committing these crimes. We have several gangs throughout the countries that are in fact involved in gang warfare for turf, for all different um, reasons. We even have them um, having gang warfare for music, this Trinidad music and all these things. Pekong throwing at each other and they have, they have um, problems with that. So we have our gang units actively involved. We have also have our task forces in the various divisions actively involved in curbing these, um, these gangs, several exercises, targeted operations, priority offenders are being targeted, the repeat offenders are being targeted as well on a regular basis, persons who have outstanding warrants are also being targeted. So on a daily basis, we are in fact um, having a lot of exercises, raid searches, persons are being arrested, taken before the court. But then the, the problem is, when they reach before the court where we have no control, we realize that they are, the court is being quite lenient with these persons. While bail is not supposed to be something to penalize them, but substantial bail should be set to keep them inside for some time. We are, in recent times in North Central Division, we arrested one man for three counts of robbery and three counts of larceny from the person. These are persons who are lowering persons, um, um, victims, to particular areas We online purchases. When they go, there's robberies. So we arrested and charged him for these six counts. He was placed on $45,000 bail back out the next day to continue. We have robbery suspects also being placed out there. People held with firearms also being sent back out. So while we are doing our part as it relates to arresting these persons, they are being sent back out. The criminals realize now that there's not much consequences to come when they commit these crimes. We arrest them, we charge them, we send them to prison. Prison is a university where they learn more criminality. They come back out doing worse, or even while they're in the prison, calling shots on the outside. So isn't it a, a function of the police also in prosecutions, particularly when persons appear first time before a magistrate for bail? Isn't, isn't it part of the process that unless they are a member of the forces, the, the defense force, it's a police prosecutor, why 
on the prosecutor's train then. There's a bail act, there's section six of the bail act that outline the criteria for bail. Why don't they then make strenuous objections? I, I don't think that it is fair that you blame a judicial officer who has a, a criteria for bail to follow risk of reoffending, whether they will interfere with witnesses on the way, the seriousness of the offense, the prevalence of the offense, the antecedents of the, the accused person. Why then doesn't the prosecution take objections to bail? Because in my experience, when objections are taken to bail, those objections are taken into account before bail is set. Why is that not being done? And I, I cannot say that that is not being done because it is being done. I have several matters in the court, and I am aware that that is being done. If it is not being done in certain circumstances, it is, it is probably because the that um, prosecutor is weak. But we have all antecedents are taken before the magistrate or um, master or any judicial officer whenever we have uh, uh, accused before the court on the first occasion, um, Mr. Chair. The, the final question before, I, before Member Munila begins this question I want to ask you is this, as it relates to the brazenness and detection, detection, sometimes even whilst the offense is being committed, someone captures it on the cell phone and it's being posted out. Why doesn't the police, or is the police utilizing that you get it on, you get it on the, what do you call it? Um, you get it on TikTok or on what uh, social media almost immediately. Is the police utilizing that? And I seem to that that is a methodology in order to review the footage. And the assailants are there because they're identified on these phones, you know. And it's out there. Why doesn't the police utilize that as part of the arsenal to at least identify and charge the perpetrators of these violent but brazen acts against Trinidad and Tobago? And I'm happy you asked that, sir, because we are in fact utilizing it. We utilize every piece of evidence that we get, you know. And, you know, we have members of the public who, are, who know these persons who committed these crimes. Some of them are not willing to come forward. However, we have police officers who have dealt with them in the past, may have charged them for several offenses, and they are able to identify them. We are utilizing these police officers to identify these persons if we do not have members of the public to identify them. As recent as two weeks ago, we had a, a suspect who has been identified through video footage or who we captured through video footage. And we place it on Beyond the Tape and other social media platforms so that we will be able to get assistance to identify the, this person. To date, no one has responded. None of the officers know him because, the, because of how, how the, um, the video was taken. But we have been utilizing these um, video footages that we get from whatever social media platform or even directly from the source of the incident. Member Munilal. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon again uh, to officers uh, present with us. Um, let me begin by just saying that uh, to myself and I imagine to all of us, this is a very important meeting. Um, uh, and why I say this is because over the past uh, months and I imagine years, this committee uh, has examined the leadership of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, primarily the commissioner, deputy commissioners, and so on. And while discussions there focus on statistics and policy, and in some cases law, today is a good opportunity that I welcome to focus on some of the operational matters as opposed to policy and, and legislation necessarily. So in that light, I just have a couple of question areas to raise. Um, I, re I recognize, of course, we have four heads of divisions. The question I'm asking may require a short answer from each, but depending on the, on the question, there's also the possibility if the answer is not readily available to commit to sending in writing to the committee. The first um, question is the issue of targets per division. There were targets, so we are informed uh, via the 2023 Violent Crime Reduction Plan targets in specific areas, um, about 11 areas or so, dealing with violent crime, homicides, uh, serious crime, etc. And you all know the areas. I wanted to get a sense in these divisions as to what extent, when March 2024, to what extent those targets were met across the division. And I'll start there. And it's for brief, and then I'll, I'll come to another issue. 
shortly. Is that okay? Afternoon, Dr. Molina. At the Eastern Division, we closed 2023 at 63% detection rate. The murders, we had a 23% reduction. Sexual offenses, 40% reduction. Robberies, 18%. Larceny, 34%. Fraud, 5%. Firearm offenses, 22% increase. Recovered, 64, 50, 58 firearms. 58 firearms. So, our targets, the reduction for murders was a 20% reduction. We did meet the target by reaching 23%. Uh, fatal RTA, we had a reduction of 25% also. The target for and right, dissolving. Violent crime, we had a 43% a detection rate also. For, from January 1 this year, we had a reduction in murders by, we have 20% Sexual offenses, 33%. Woundings and shootings, 17%. Robberies, 12%. Larceny, general larceny, we had 80%. We had larceny dwelling house, had 40% reduction. Fraud, 60% reduction. Breaking offenses, had a 40% reduction. Other SRCs, 44% reduction. Total reduction in serious crimes, moved from 234 to 125 which was a 47% reduction. And in our central division, as I said before, which I joined in September of 2023, um, the targets were not met in that division. As a matter of fact, um, the detection rate remained at, we closed at 17% detection rate last year. Um, as it stands this year, we are seeing some improvement. We have a reduction in serious crime on a whole up to this year, at this time in um, March. We have our detection rate is now 25%. We are ranking fourth in the country. Um, we have been Eastern Division is first. We have Tobago Division second, Southwestern Division, and then North Central Division um, is fourth on that list in there. Um, our murders. Is we have a 19% reduction in our murders. Our violent crime is up. However, the shooting, sorry, shooting and woundings are up. That is mainly because we have several enforcement with police officers, violent exchanges where officers are in fact victims of shootings. So they accounted for some of the, the um, shooting victims in these matters. That's the reason for the height, for the um, increase. Our pillar crimes now are and larceny motor vehicles, uh, robberies, general larceny, and break-ins and burglaries. Uh, based on that, I have in fact uh, formed a team quite recently uh, to deal with these pillar crimes in our division. So they are in fact actively engaged in combating these um, type of crimes. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Um, the Northern Division North, I don't have the specific figures for um, every um, target. Um, however, um, we are on a downward trend with reference to the um, number of serious crimes. And I have a figure before me, um, Northern Division North in 2023. We are 216 for the period January 1st to February 26th. Um, this was the period that we would have used for if the meeting would have taken place the, uh, about a month ago. And those are the most updated figures we had at the time. And we haven't deviated much from that. So it went from 216 serious crimes over the period to 114. That's a 47% reduction in serious crimes over the corresponding period. So we are on the downward trend is where we want to be. However, we have a challenge with robbery still, especially in the Arima district, and we're actively working to, to, to stymie that effort, stymie the efforts of the criminal element. 
and we have also met with some success there too, because the, if I can put it this way, the increase has decreased. The rate of increases in the robberies in the Rima district has decreased because of the initiatives we have put into place. So we are seeing positive um, trends, even though we did not meet the targets for 2023. Good afternoon again, Doctor. <coughs> I, um, I have a breakdown for the period from the 1st of uh, January this year to present. And in this case, in the murders, about 27% 20 decrease in murders. In violent crimes, there was a 37% decrease. And in serious reported crime, other serious reported crimes, a 48% decrease. So these targets were actually met going forward. However, we have, as the Northern Division, uh, issue with the last name motor vehicles, there was an increase uh, from 16 in 2023 to 45 in 2024 for this period. However, there are systems in place to deal with this, and we are seeing also seeing a downward trend. Um, the de detection rate also, we, for the period, there was an 18% detection rate in murders. That, that is out of the 11 murders, two were solved. In violent crimes, we have a 15% detection rate. On firearm scenes, there was an 18% decrease. Uh, reason for that is in the same period, comparing last year, the same period, there was a catchment of firearms, a uh, large quantity of firearms were seized. I provide any other further statistics as we go along, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question area, which is related uh, to the divisions, is this issue of your established divisional strength as opposed to your actual strength. If, if I can have, get some type of um, brief understanding of where we are in terms of you know, what is required in the division uh, on the establishment and what is actual, actually in place at this time and the gap that may exist. Mr. Khan? So, the strength at Eastern Division is not how it's supposed to be at this time. We are facing a shortage of manpower based on the dynamics of the division changing, the increase in workload. We have, when you look at Valencia, Sunny Grande, Matura, the population has increased drastically via the squatting areas and so on. There is more pressure on the officers with the less resources. It's only so efficient you could become. And that's the issue with us and manpower. We are short. Yes, in the North Central Division, we have a um, adequate strength. Our strength is um, a total of 323 persons. We have that. Um, we have just a short of that by six persons. We have two ASP short, um, two inspectors short, and two sergeants short. That, that's how we are standing at this stage. But we are, in fact, making do with what we have at this time. With reference to that particular question, the Northern Division North, um, our sanction strength um, has been exceeded by uh, approximately 133 officers um, by the injection of officers from the outside. So we have some full-time SRPs and some units that are assisting the Northern Division North um, on the directions of the commissioner. So we are adequately strengthened. With reference to that question, I will go straight into the, the constable shortage in Southern Division, where there's a sanction strength of 491 constables. However, at present, our actual strength is 367, which is unfortunately a shortage of, shortage, shortage of 124 constables. But we are getting by with our resources, effectively deployed, sir. a few comments on approach and strategy. One of the challenges that we often hear and read about is, of course, uh, you know, almost an age-old complaint now uh, about customer service and about uh, community police relations and so on. These are things that pop up all the time. And as elected persons, we received reports, allegations, and so on. Um, of course, we are in no position to determine uh, the accuracy of these type of reports. But we know that there is a focus by the TTPS, and the commissioner indicated that as well, on customer relations, on 
interfacing and building trust because one of the challenges is that persons may or may not uh, collaborate or um, assist law enforcement uh, on the basis of, of trust, on the basis of confidence. That, that is an operating principle. And I wanted to know from the divisions at, at this stage, are there specific uh, strategies, are there specific programs that are geared towards building trust in the, between the police and the community? At Eastern Division, community policing is a big thing for us based on the culture of our division. So we would have each station district would have town meetings in each station district. We have a very vibrant station council in each of the areas. We have community walkabouts in 2023. We had 76 formation of various WhatsApp groups within the division. And it depends on the area. So in certain areas, we have it as the WhatsApp group is between farmers. In other areas, it's between other persons. And sometime last year, we had a spate of robberies in Rio Claro district. And as a result of one of the WhatsApp group that was found, formed, it led to the <coughs> apprehension and charging of several persons with firearms and so on. So the community policing aspect, of, we use both, we go both ways. We enforce the hard policing, but we also mix it with the softer side. We have the school lectures. We have personnel from the various station who are part of everything that the school is doing. So we cover those areas. We don't wait until people go out of hand before we intervene. Concerning the customer service in the station, training is ongoing. Sometimes an officer, you might get a complaint about a specific officer. And you will have to ask yourself what is the reason because he might also be under some kind of pressure too. So at times, you would call them, talk to them, find out if they need any intervention or if something is going on that you should know about that you could assist them with. And that is one of the ways that we deal with it in Eastern Division. Um, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, um, one of the five strategic priorities is community engagement. And um, under community engagement in our division and restoring public trust and confidence, we look at the improved customer service. Now, we came into some bashian recently with St. Joseph Police Station, right? The world knows that. But um, we did some training as it relates to every single member of the North Central Division. That training was, in fact, held at St. Joseph Police Station in our conference room. So it signifies something. We have seen an improvement in the attitude of the officers. Now, we, we are still getting old reports of what happened, but we are in fact seeing an improvement in the attitude of the officers. We also I, I ensure that each shift has a sergeant now, so that we have proper supervision in the major stations. We have three major stations, um, St. Joseph, Tunapuna, Aruka. Those are the three big stations. So I have a sergeant in each shift for proper supervision. We are also employ active listening because People come to make reports, they need to listen to what they are saying so that we can actually give them the proper service that they desire. Um, I've also decentralized um, units that were in one area. So, for instance, we had a task force that was, the, the, the entire team was up in Aruka Police Station District. And we want to build the confidence and trust of the, of the, of the um, public. So, we were looking at quick response. So, I decentralized them to, half of the team went to Tunapuna Police Station. We also looked at even see visiting scenes. So we had a team of officers at Maloney Police Station because our division was just split recently, about two years ago. So the entire CSI team was based at Maloney Police Station. I brought them down to Tunapuna Police Station. So we have quicker response as it relates to the CSI arriving on a scene. So we realize now that you know, the, the public or, or the persons making reports are seeing a difference as it relates to <coughs> response by officers. So we have the first responders and then we have the CSI responding shortly thereafter. We have training in, in investigations, so we have improved investigations, just the reason for our increased detection rate. And then we have um, station management training as well. So all this leads to a better relationship with the members of the public and improved detection rate. Feedback, recently we had um, this, the said team that did the training for the customer service. 
they went to all the station and we are in fact going to install some suggestion box for feedback as it relates to what is taking place in the stations. We would not be open in the division. We do have access to open it. However, the, the team that is in fact dealing with customer service will be the ones who will be vetting these um, suggestions that came in. We have our victim support, witness and victim support at the North Central Division. They are also engaged with our witnesses and victims um, to, you know, to, for counseling and all these other issues. And we have also re-established the disciplinary process in the North Central Division. It was lapsed for a while, however, myself and my superintendent, Mr. Norbert, there. I am um, the tribunal officer for the special reserve officers, while he is the tribunal officer for the, the um, regular officers. Officers, so, I know, and I want you to be fulsome in your response, but we don't want Member Munial to go into a second inning. So the next two commanders, if, if it is that you have similar initiatives, tell us the ones, the other two that you don't have, please. Yes, sir. So I um, tend to try to focus a lot more and um, if you're talking about programs for building trust and confidence, um, example setting. Um, if we don't set the right example as police officers, then how can, how can the public have confidence and trust in us? So sometimes they see police officers doing the wrong thing at traffic lights and so on. I frown on it and I talk about it. Um, dealing with reports against police officers, we cannot be biased. If you want the public to trust that we can deal with them and deal with them fairly, we must also deal with the police officers that are errant, and I'm very big on that. And I publish that. It's not to say that um, we, we, we I'm coming down on police officers, but we have to face the, the reality that we are all around from time to time, and we have to be fair. And finally, um, yes, serious crimes and um, crimes involving violence are at the forefront of people's minds. But every victim feels that his crime or his, his instance is important and is weighty. So we also pay some more attention to the minor offenses and the minor crimes and give people some feedback, because we have to be balanced. SRC is on the national radar, but every victim, his crime is important. I focus on that. That builds confidence in my belief, in my view. Uh, just to add, uh, we have these initiatives in the Southern Division, but just to add, uh, with the town hall meetings, I will ensure that there is follow-up on any concern raised. I had my last meeting in Laramin two Thursdays ago, and there were concerns raised, and there was a Thursday and Friday I put things in place. Also when persons will be calling, I give out my number and they will call. And I will, if I can do it myself, I will have these concerns addressed in a very timely manner. Also one of my things in Southern Vision, calls for service should be responded to immediately. No excuses for not responding to a, to a call. That is one of my things I just want to add and, and in support of the other initiatives, which we have in the Southern Division also. Also, just to add, we had, um, like, in the Princess Town, we had a domestic violence outreach program, which was well attended, and information was shared. Thank you very much. We are speaking about divisions, yes? Can I want to talk about communities. So I want all of you to tell me and tell the public, what are the communities that you speak of that relates to your division. 30 seconds, what are the communities, for example, in Eastern Division, the communities? Chairman, uh, Eastern Division starts at Valencia. You have stage, is Valencia, then you go up to the north, Matura, Toku, Matlat, Sunny Grandi, Beach, Rio Claro, Miaro, Manzanilla. We have nine stations in our district. That's division. East. Right, so you're talking Valencia, to, to up to, straight up to Matlot. Right. The, straight, right, and then you go... Member Lutch Media is telling me down the stretch. I don't know what stretch he's going to carry, <laughs> but I suspect that is by, by the two pillars, by, by Royal Castle, and the police station on the left, right, on the right hand, and down the stretch. Yes? Straight up to Matlot. To Grandi on one end and to the new road on the and other. And then you end at Rio Claro, starting from Sunny Grandi, and you go straight to Rio Claro. It's the biggest land area for any division. Um, Mr. Smith. North Central Division, uh, the communities we speak about is the Marca St. Joseph community. The St. Joseph community, which starts at Mount Lambert and heads east. We have the Tunapuna community, Aruka, and Piaco. So five station districts that was separated from the northern 
division. That's a densely populated area. Densely populated. About approximately 122,000 persons. Densely thousand populated persons. area. Mr. Montrichard, what is the northern division north? What is that? Right, so it starts at Maloney, goes on to Arima, Malabar, Pinto, Kumuto, La Hoqueta, and San Rafael, which is to be revived shortly. That's, that's so that area is a challenge. Yes, member, Misha. Go back and what is the population size in the Eastern Division, Mr. Khan? Chairman, that is difficult at this time because of the increase at Valencia, Matura, and San Average, Iran. average. We won't, we won't hold it as the Census Division. Average. I'd say maybe over 100,000 people. 100,000, but it's a vast area. It's, it's large it's because, vast because you're starting from, as I said before, the boundaries. You so, have Grand River in part of yeah. you? Yes. All right. So about 100,000. Um, Mr. Montrichard? You know that your area, that's a challenge, the Northern Division North, that's yes, an sir. area, that's a challenged area, yes? Right. So Northern Division North, this is from the CSO 2011. Um, we have 125,157 persons and 2,950 businesses, 42 institutions. Um, Mr. Sudin, which is the Southern Division, yes? Uh, the, uh, yes, sir. the Southern Division starts at St. Margaret's, coming down to Marabella, Monrepo, San Fernando, La Romain. Let me go back east to uh, St. Madeline, Princess Town, Tableland, Moruga. Moruga, and all the way back to Barapo. So it's a large division similar to that's, Eastern Division. That's a wide radius. Yes, Mitchell, you know those areas? It's a wide, Mr. Munilal. Do you know those areas? What is your population? What, 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 what is your population? The latest approximation, about 300,000 persons. Tell us something, briefly. You've given us the statistics, yes? We have the statistics, 69%. Are the members in those communities, officers, feeling safer? have a sense of security with respect to the police and this and the criminal activity in those communities. Mr. Khan. Chairman, at Eastern Division, although we have a high solving rate, low crime at this time, the important thing is for somebody is the feeling of safety. But social media can direct how a person feel. And social media, when they clump all the other divisions, or you look at this, the, what is seen on the newspaper and on all the other social platforms, you believe in that everywhere you live is unsafe. But that is not accurate. So then why don't you do a counter-narrative on social media? You all have, beyond, beyond the tape, you have other aspects. Why don't you develop a platform? To say, not to say go out and be um, laissez-faire, but to say, look, this is what the police is doing, and I do direct this to Mr. Smith, Montreal, Sudin. What is being done then to so, counteract that? So, I will con if I may continue, yes. John. Yes. That is one of the reasons why on, we have a divisional chat, and we have a media ambassador on it from the TTPS. And from time to time, the successes that we reap in Eastern Division goes up on the police platform. We also do the walkabouts in the community, the town meetings, informing the residents about the accuracy of the places where they live. So it is something that we continue to work on to build the confidence that you're living in a safer place. And it's not simply everything gone out of hand. Social media could give that impression. I reserve for you all to answer, but I remember Lutch Medial. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, all right, so I want to focus a little bit my questions on strategies and metrics, a little bit more on the metrics, but on some of your strategies. Um, a couple of things I wanted to say, though. Um, you know, I hear what you all say with respect to the upward fight, um, particularly when you make arrests and persons find themselves back out on the streets. Now, 
there's a big difference between sometimes what should happen and what does happen. And Mr. Smith, I wish everyone had your um, discipline because in a lot of cases as a practitioner, someone who is observant and in touch with what's happening, I can tell you that at a first occasion, sometimes we do not even have complainants coming to court. We do not have prosecutors who have, I, I, if I had a dollar for every time a police officer told a, magist, a judicial officer, the system is down and I cannot produce a CR, and a judicial officer will say to them, well, I'm going to grant bail until you can provide me with the CR on the next occasion. Um, I'd be very rich, I wouldn't need this job. <laughs> if I could tell you how many times, for example, you have anecdotal evidence being put forward by victims who say that I'm being harassed by the perpetrator, but when they are asked to produce evidence of a report, they say, well, I went to the station, but they didn't give me no receipt. They said, have no receipt book in the station. It would also be a challenge. So it's uh, one of the reasons that, and one, the approach that I take to some of these meetings is to really use the opportunity to tell you that policies are great, but unless they translate into the everyday interactions between what happens with members from every constable that's sitting at a desk in a charge room to members of the public, you will have that problem and that challenge with building trust and confidence. So I applaud your efforts and I applaud the approach that you'd like to take. And I do believe that bail sometimes is not um, you know, reasonable when you look at offenses and so on, and perhaps that, that's something we raise with the judiciary and training and all of those things as well for judicial officers. But, um, you know, one hand doesn't clap sometimes. So I just use the opportunity to raise those issues with you. Um, I want to ask a question because some of you, many of you have raised two things that jumped out at me, and that's the use of the word culture, understanding the culture when you come into a division. Um, someone has also mentioned that you know, based on the culture in the divisions that you are in. There are specific cultures in different areas. Some of you are covering very large divisions where you would have a difference in culture. So the culture in San Fernando is very different from the culture in Barakpo. You would agree with me sometimes, and you have to have different approaches. When you have a movement of officers from, let's say, specifically your detectives, but even as high up as your senior superintendents, that tends to kind of hit a reset button in a way. Mr. Smith, when you left Southern Division, there was protest. <laughs> Nobody wanted you to go, right? No offense to you, Mr. Sudin. <laughs> we didn't know you then. But I know that the business community and persons within Southern Division felt that there was a lot of work put in um, when you were there and that there was a rapport that they had developed and that things were happening. And I think that the fact that Southern Division, based on the statistics provided, Southern Division has the second highest crime total, but we had also the second highest detection rate. That spoke a lot about what was going on in 2023. Uh, Mr. Sudin, I, I know of your meeting in St. Benedict's. I, I, um, I have a full brief on it. And I think you are picking up where Mr. Smith left off, but that isn't to say that on every occasion when you have a, a, a transition of leadership within a division, but you also have movement of key people like detectives who have built relationships with people within your division, that that could affect the best strategies that you implement and that you roll out. I just wanna hear comments um, from perhaps both of you, just because I'm familiar, both of you, um, what you think about that, um, how do you deal with when you enter into a new division and you have to step into the shoes of someone who has left and you have to pick up and learn the culture of that division and try to get with their strategies, which may be different from the strategies that you know where you come from. And um, you know, wh what are you doing and what are your views in terms of the, the keeping um, or perhaps the, the period of time that officers in the leadership of a specific division might be there? Thank you, ma'am, and that, that's a really pertinent question because, as you rightly know, it's happened recently with me. And, um, you know, and today I was thinking, uh, um, what I do as a, as a divisional commander is I try to maintain the station commanders especially because I know that we can move at any point in time, but maintain the station commanders at that station because I know that they put in a lot of work with the communities. We have station councils, we have neighborhood watch groups, we have all these, um, the walkabouts, we have the, the school lectures, all these things taking place, which are implemented by the station commanders and persons under them. 
even the detectives, as, as we say, they build a relationship with the, the, the um, residents in, and business people in the area. And by moving them on a regular basis, if we don't have much foresight, then we will be disrupting what we have already built. So we need to think about what we are doing. The culture, when I came into North Central Division, I never worked at this part of Trinidad at any point in my service. So it's a brand new culture I came into. So much different from Southern Division. Although I worked in Western Division, Port of Spain Division, each division is a different culture. But it was a culture shock from Southern, which is partly rural and not as much violent as the North Central Division. The population density as well is a lot to deal with in, in, in North Central Division. I have approximately 27, in fact, over 27 housing developments, AGC developments in North Central Division. Over 27. We have two more being um, constructed now. Right? One at Cora, one at Lopino, and one coming on stream soon after. So this is addition, adding to more persons coming in that division, in addition to the re normal residents who are in that division as well. Right? So it's, it's a lot to deal with, and the culture with even the officers as well, because each division has a different culture as it relates to the officers. So they must understand my style, and I must understand their style, and we have to try to work together to get to come to common ground. And in the time that it takes to iron out those issues, do you feel that it has an Im that, that process impacts upon the effectiveness of your strategies and the rollout of your strategies? I totally agree. However, we have to have short-term strategies to fill in the, that, those gaps. So that's what we do. We put in the short-term strategies to so fill in that so that we wouldn't have much lapse. Thank you. Mr. Sudin, I, I noticed that, you know, as I said, you have second highest crime, but second highest detection coming out of 2023, even with your shortage of 124 constables. So how, how have you been now coming into division, into the division, and I don't know where you came from, but how has the culture and having to step into the division under those circumstances, how have you managed it? Ma'am, first I'd like to thank Mr. Smith for leaving our well-running division, which I met. Also, I was no, I'm no stranger to the Southern Division. I haven't worked there as a constable all the way to a sergeant. Then I left, I came into Port of Spain, I'm back in Southern Division. So it was not like a culture shock for me, actually. Um, with the systems in place, which was real good, good running systems, I maintain it as much as possible. What I tried to do, I had conversations with my senior officers on where we needed to probably improve on systems, we will have. But um, it's three months there now, going in three, month, in three months, and I'm still settling in and trying to improve on these, these policies that Mr. Smith would have activated. And I'm, I know I can call on him anytime for any advice as we are go, we, we are go along in, in running the division. Okay. Now, apart from crime totals and detection rates, are there any other metrics that you will be using? Um, I know that the typical, when we ask about, um, for metrics from CCPS, we get minor crime and serious crime. But you would agree with me that serious crimes cover a wide range um, of crimes. You know, robbery with violence or murders, sexual offenses, etc. Um, do you have a regular disaggregation of serious crimes, for example, and examination of each particular category of crime and your you know, your numbers in terms of offenses, in terms of detection and so on? Because uh, you would agree with me that they are different units that would be um, collaborating with the division in order. So you have, for example, fraud squad, you have homicide, etc. So is there a disaggregation of those crimes by the specific types and particularly where you have to work with other units within the TTPS in order to solve those crimes? And how often do you do that and how often do you examine those numbers? In the Southern Division, we have the Child Protection Unit where there, there are several reports or reports in the Southern Division being investigated by the Child Protection Unit. I know those investigations might be lengthy investigations, so we might have reports for this year, but might be de detected next year, as well as vice versa from last year might be detected this year. So that will sometimes, and also with the fraud matters, that will sometimes throw out our detection rate, particularly with these, these two matters, because I know the, the sexual offenses matter, they, they are a large number. Right, so we, we are mindful in Southern Division. So we are mindful of it, which when we 
the way in our metrics. Yeah. Uh, how often you think you, you, how often as a divisional commander then would you sit and, as I said, disaggregate those numbers, look at the figures and perhaps review your strategies based on what, what is presented in terms of the numbers? In going forward, I will do that on a monthly basis to know where I'm with my targets, any detection and the reduction in any serious crimes. So I'll do it very often, monthly basis. Any other officer yeah. who wishes to give a different perspective or have an opinion, I'm happy to it's hear. More, it's more or less the same thing with, with us in North Central Division. However, on a regular basis, in fact, it's a, a um, bi, bi, um, bi monthly basis, we keep meetings with the homicide department, right? Because we have several murders in North Central Division. So we share information on our gang unit together with the intelligence unit of the homicide. We keep meetings together. Um, we also meet with the the, um, the child protection unit as well, because they have several persons that they need to arrest. So they get support from us in our division as, a, as it relates to picking up these suspects. The fraud squad, they also send some of their investigations to us as well, because I think it's under 50,000, 50,000 under, they send to us in the division while they deal with the higher ones. So we, we each one help the other one, and we have meetings that we keep um, with each other so that we could assist as it relates to um, arrest and otherwise. Thank you, Member. Can we move to Member Richards now? You can. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. Sure. Right. I had made a specific note about this because um, I think Mr. Sudin mentioned um, a large quantity of firearms seizure, uh, seize firearms being seized. Right. A question that the public asked me, and that I was asked to ask here today, is that a lot of times we hear about large firearm and drug seizures, but we don't hear about arrests that accompany them. And that's, um, that's something that is of grave concern to the public. Um, I mean, I understand sometimes the way it is you get information by the time you get somewhere, the suspects have fled. But could the number, I mean, could you say whether or not when you have these large seizures taking place, whether there's follow-up and in how many cases you are able to eventually make an arrest in relation to some of these large firearm and drug seizures? I can speak about the, the last drug seizure in the Southwestern Division. That was a few weeks ago, with the cocaine and the marijuana. It was found in, in a forested area, but two miles in a forested area. Surveillance was done, and based on intelligence, we went in there. There is follow-up, the investigation is being done with the transnational agency unit the, towards effecting any arrest, or at least getting the source and the destination of, of these drugs. So there are in, in investigations ongoing, continuing into these matters towards any arrest or at least the source. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon again, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here and for your continued service uh, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago under what clearly are the very difficult circumstances and to, of course, the people under your, under your remit. Uh, just for members of the public following, because we're using terms that sometimes the public does not understand, what would uh, contribute to being in the detection rate as opposed to a solvency rate? Could you give us some simple definitions, please? A detection rate as different from a solvency rate. What, what's, what would contribute to a detection rate? Let me start with that. A detection rate is the, the rate of the amount of crime that you solve in relation to the amount of crime that was reported, and then they, they, they derive a percentage from that. Okay, thank you. So you graciously supplied some data here, which I see some trends in, where the four top areas in terms of crimes reported, uh, topping that would be the Northern Division, with 2,396 reported, and a 29% detection rate. Uh, second will be Southern Division, 1,443, with a 49% detection rate. Third would be the Central Division, with 1,308, with a 22% detection rate. And following that would be Port of Spain, with 1,064, with a 12% detection rate. Uh, of course, the more densely populated areas, one would understand, would uh, tend to have higher crime rates. Uh, in these cases, uh, there was, there's an anomaly, of course, with uh, Port of Spain and 
uh, northern division, which is highly densely populated at, at the estimated 200 and 125,000 people. Could you, uh, last week at the police uh, service press conference led by Commissioner here with Christopher, uh, acting ACP, Vina Butler indicated that there, the police were aware that there were a few persons, and she stressed on a few persons committing most, many of the crimes, if not most of the crimes, uh, suggesting to me, listening, that the police were aware, if you were saying a few, you know, you have a fair idea of who these people are. Would that be a correct assumption in terms of gangs or gang members? Well, I wouldn't like to, um, Ms. Butler, put it in her particular way. Yes, we are, in fact, aware of some of the persons who commit these crimes, the, the groups who commit these crimes. However, there's a difference between being aware, having information, and even having evidence to prosecute them for these offenses. So sometimes we have information that this um, particular person committed a murder, but we don't have the evidence. Sometimes we arrest them for homicide, but they are not ready for them because they don't have the evidence. So if we have other crimes where there are suspects, for instance, robberies, shooting, woundings, otherwise, we put them in ID parade. And if homicide is ready, by the time we are through with them, probably that's in a, a day or two, they may um, um, interview them or move forward with them. However, if we don't have any evidence at all, but we only have information, it don't make much sense at that stage. What is the challenge with the police in those cases? Because I'm presuming that, you know, the I'm afraid to use the term here. The SSA has <laughs> indicated to us, I'm not going down that route, Chairman, I'm just using the phrase, that there is a particular number of gangs in the country, according to their information. And the police, I'm sure, are also aware of a particular number of gangs in, in the country. Would it be that the divisional heads who are here with us are okura with the number of gangs operating in the areas, particularly the densely populated areas, which are indicating the highest levels of crime? Well, I can speak for North Central Division and probably for Southern Division at, at some point. But in fact, in North Central Division, we are aware of some of the gangs that are existing. We have some of them with some erroneous names. Some gangs are just coming up, or some group of men that just come up suddenly and start to commit crimes. Now, we have the ones that we, we know, I wouldn't call the names here, but we are, in fact, actively targeting them. We have been um, engaged in operations, raid searches, uh, arrests, all these things. It's a constant, um, uh, ongoing um, process that we are doing raid searches all the time. So it's not that we are lapsing. It's that we are actively pursuing these persons. When we have evidence, we prosecute. If we don't have... We so you're aware of the gangs, generally speaking, operating in the Central Division? In North Central Division. And would that be true for the Eastern Division, uh, the Northern Division, North and also the Southern Division, gentlemen? So, in Eastern Division, we do not have such a large gang problem as in the other divisions. So, yes, we'll be aware of the various persons operating and, commit, and who may be committing crime in Eastern Division. Not necessarily all are gang members. We have a database that we have created, and based on intelligence, we build on that as time go on. So it gives us a better indication as to what and who we are dealing with in the district. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Montrichard? Yes, sir. Um, I got a gang brief recently, and um, by my count, um, there were six gangs and um, comprising about 139 members. In the Northern, northern North Division, Division, yes, sir. Six gangs, about how many, how many members? 139 sir? known members. Known members. Yes, sir. And Mr. Sudin. Yes, in the Southern Division, there's just three major gangs. Uh, we have a gang unit in the Southern Division that's closely monitoring these gangs. But at present, they are basically not a threat or, or they are very dormant. That is. And I'm sure you'll collaborate at Comstat. Would you find that gangs are moving between divisions? I'm sure they're not limiting themselves to one division. Yeah, yes, they are. And um, that's, the, that's the reason we have interdivisional exercises and information sharing. We also have regional gang units. So ASP Pitu is here is one of the regional gang unit commanders. So he, he, is, he is the commander for the um, North Central, Northern, and Eastern, yes, Eastern Division. So he's the regional commander, and they, and they keep regular meetings. They 
would also interact with the other regional commanders as well as um, the gang operatives, the gang unit operatives in the other divisions. Can the SPP give us a sense of what the challenges are with one tracking these gangs, monitoring their movements, and also uh, correlating the information that would may, may be translated into evidence for uh, arrest, charging, and prosecution? Pleasant afternoon again. So we recognize that the divisions in themselves posed a challenge in that we dealt with the gangs from a divisional perspective. Having said that, the gangs would migrate from area to area. If you want to look at greener pastures, recruitment, uh, sense of territory. So the regional gang approach was more or less to treat with these issues. In terms of prosecuting challenges, it still leaves us with the job of identifying specifically association, which in itself for court purposes have a particular meaning. And against the constitutional rights of persons, which is the right to associate, it is a, an exercise that must be managed carefully in order that if or when persons are prosecuted, it is able to withstand judicial scrutiny. The positives that have come out of this type of approach is that we are able to identify the movements of gangs, the, the strength that the gangs would have in the varying divisions. It has also given us the opportunity to be proactive in that if something happens, let's say in Port of Spain, God forbid, then we know based on the gang alignment, we can put measures in place to treat it in Eastern Division. And we have had recent success with that type of approach in terms of being proactive. We have also been able to marry our different skill sets. There are officers who would know about persons uh, within certain spaces, and that would be to the advantage of persons in other divisions who may not have that type of information, that type of knowledge. So given the regular meetings that we would have when we are discussing individual priority offenders, persons of interest, uh, the modus operandi of gangs, that information sharing has gone really, really far in terms of giving us a full grasp as to how the gang is operating, uh, their, their source, because different gangs have different sources when it comes to finance. Some gangs may be prone to robberies. Some gangs may be prone to larceny motor vehicles. Some gangs are prone to murder for hire, and so on. So different gangs operate differently. However, that difference is sometimes limited to a geographic space. So although you may have a particular gang functioning in Port of Spain, they may not carry out the same crime type in Eastern Division. It might be different. So they are just based on the environment. I was going to ask you that question, and I was hoping not to freeze it in a way that would cause you to uh, tip off the gang operators who may be watching the read papers and they look at streams also. Yeah. So, so I will ask it, and ask it in this way. So from what you've said, the TTPS is monitoring the changes in dynamic in gang activity in Trinidad and Tobago because they are dynamic anywhere yes. in the world. Yes. One of the, the issues facing the country, and, and you've given a good uh, account of gang profiles and their affinity to different kinds of crimes, types of crimes in different divisions, is the issue of your, uh, earlier on, one of your members identified the top levels of crime in, in terms of robberies, motor vehicle last new, it seems to be a continuing issue, break-ins, and also the barometer which, with which the country primarily judges the uh, success of the police service, which is murders. When you have a heinous situation as which occurred at Hart Place recently, which drew national attention, which, I mean, uh, drive by seemingly, or somebody walking into an area and in a cavalier manner, just spraying bullets and you have five casualties. What is the police response to that without, of course, giving a real strategy and stuff like that in terms of assuring the public that, well, the police is on this 
and that person may be on the radar and arrest and an arrest may be eminent or arrests may be eminent. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we, we, we view it from, from different standpoints. Firstly, we look at the preventative aspect because usually something like that, we would look at the aspect of whether we can expect reprisals. So for our first port of call is to ensure that we manage that situation to the extent that it doesn't impact other areas similarly. Then we have the follow-up in terms of the investigative aspect. So the investigative aspect is what is going to go towards bringing persons to account and looking at the aspect of charging and prosecution. Regarding the, the, the proactivity that I spoke of, um, and if we had to use the example that you use regarding what took place in, 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 in Port of Spain, uh, there are certain gangs that have their tentacles in areas that might be more vulnerable, so to speak, because there are persons who might be, would be victims who also migrate. So it's not just understanding the gang that might be more aggressive, but also understanding the persons who they may be rivaling with. And all those approaches, all those type of information, intelligence, data is captured in order to manage the situation so that we don't have that particular incident spilling over into the other divisions and creating the same kind of havoc that we don't want. And my final question before I defer to my colleague, Member Webster Roy, is under the banner of divisional management and oversight, uh, it is clear that the divisions are collaborating, which is a good thing, uh, but the police cannot do it alone. Uh, we are well aware of that anywhere in the world. Uh, technology is one way that the police service in any jurisdiction can increase their evidence gathering. But I want to focus a bit on collaboration with other law enforcement agencies and also business, because uh, one, one of you gentlemen described the number of businesses in your area, and in our context, businesses have a lot of technology to protect their investments. What is that, what can you uh, report to us in terms of how those collaborations are going? One, with primarily the Toronto Tobago Defense Force, and two, collaborating with the business community. Are there any challenges getting, for example, uh, because you're also protecting, in addition to people, which is the priority, business interests and communities, not necessarily in that order, with private firms, private security companies, and businesses providing information, providing support, and providing evidence through CCTV camera footage or whatever in aid of evidence to support your efforts in uh, apprehending and charging persons who commit crimes? Vice Chair, direct that to me. <laughs> Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. Um, yes. No, no, I, I said so because it's fall, it falls strictly in what we were doing recently. Right. Um, recently, as it relates to the business community and our involvement with them, we have our station council. So the Tunapuna station council is starting right now because of the initiative that we came up with as it relates to cameras. So we call it Project Eagle Eye. That was launched on the 7th of, of March this year in Tunapuna district. This is a project where, through the business community and our station council, we installed um, approximately 100 or just over 100 cameras in the business sector of Tunapuna. I wouldn't re reveal the areas right at this stage. Um, these cameras are monitored in Tunapuna police station, so we have a monitor room that we also set up. Um, the, each camera is, uh, we have officers working on a 24-hour shift, so we don't have any time where there are not any officers in that area. They have been trained by the, by the company that, that installed the cameras. So we have retrievals, we have monitoring, and we have persons um, trained to give evidence in court for the retrieval as well. Um, we also have, you spoke about the security, we spoke about defense force. We have been having joint patrols with the defense force. We have collaboration with the municipal police, the traffic wardens, the transit police, the licensing um, authority. We also have, um, um, collaboration with the, the security companies in the district. So when we have long holidays like these, 
We have security companies. We have carnival security companies coming in and assisting in patrols. We have officers on board. We have stakeholders meeting on a monthly basis with a lot of the um, businesses in the, in the district. Eric William Medical Science Center. We have the airport authority. We have the um, Titi Post. A lot of them. We have these meetings and we share strategies. We have right now. Are, are they sharing in particular the private businesses? Are they, have they been willing to share CCTV footage with yes. you? Yes, we have that, and, and they are willing. Even the malls, and they, they are even willing. They have trained personnel who are even willing to give the evidence as well, having retrieved the, the footage. So we have that level of collaboration with them, and it's going quite well. Officer, you know, apart from willingness, yes. police, in terms of solving crime and serious yes. crime, have the power to curse. You would go willing first. Yes. That's your first option. But you know if there's unwilling, there are certain... Yes, of course. Legal legitimate avenues open to the police to secure those items of evidence in terms of solving a crime. You know that? Yes, we are aware. Yes. Right. I just have one before I go to Member Webster Roy, piggybacking on Member Richards. Today in, in Woodbrook, there's a meeting. I know the divisional head for this area is not here, but there's a town meeting in the Woodbrook Police Station at 6.30 today with respect to the Woodbrook community and the police officers, would you all be encouraging those types of meetings throughout the country? Yes, each divisional commander must keep tongue meetings. <clears throat> so in some divisions, we have tongue meetings twice per month. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice rotation that we have. We, we meet with the um, residents, the business community, <clears throat> and you know, um, the member, Ms. Gianti, spoke about um, you know, something about community. And, you know, this is where we, we strengthen our engagements with the community and we get feedback. So by virtue of what is being said on the, on, on, on the, on the tongue meetings, this is where we get our feedback. Don't you think that initiative of the Eagle Eye Initiative is an initiative that should be and ought to be implemented throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly okay. in highly densely populated areas or areas of high risk in particular. But since our launch on the 7th, the phone has not stopped ringing. Up to last night, the, um, the Prime Minister was in, in the North Central Division in a, um, um, talks with the Prime Minister. And um, the president of the Tunapuna Station Council did a presentation to him. Well, just spoke a, a few minutes on it, on the Project Eagle Eye. He bought into it as well. So we are on the map. We have several divisions calling us divisional commanders calling. We even have business community calling us to get this eagle eye. So it, it's, it's really out there and, and persons I are... I need you to engage the business community, but talking about community, you are right up the alley of Member Webster Roy. Member Webster Roy. Um, Chair, if I may. Yes. That project with the camera that you spoke of is also at Eastern Division, Sunny Grandi. Started last year. And we also have a strong business community and some of the initiatives where the business would share their cameras and everything with us is also a monitoring area. So I think it is picking up in various areas and we would, maybe in the short term, we'll see other areas having it. Member Webster Roy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, good afternoon. And let me take this opportunity to thank you for your service, all of you. Um, Mr. Smith, I believe in your opening you mentioned that the police is usually at the tail end when it comes to crime and criminalities because early on institutions would have failed, the family, the church, um, education system, etc. With that in mind, what level of collaboration exists between the police and various social institutions in terms of addressing the social issues that may lead persons towards crime and criminality, that's one. And two, how many of you foster police youth clubs in your division? And how do you empower your police youth clubs to assist in changing mindsets and changing behaviors from the littlest child so that we could create a future where we have less violence and persons who are more tolerant? Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you for asking that. And that, um, we are, in fact, engaged with other um, social organizations to assist us in our fight against crime and, and, and dealing with the, the youths 
as they, you know, may be inclined to go in that direction. One of the, the, the youth clubs I want to speak about in, in particular is the St. Joseph Youth Club, run by Ms. Um, Corporal Goddard and um, Ms. Dikoto. Now, Ms. Dikoto is a civilian, while Corporal Goddard is, is um, the police officer in charge of the youth club. Two weeks ago, we received an um, a 82-inch computer from Huawei, which also which motivated the members of that youth club. We have over 100 um, members in that youth club. We have to work on a shift system because of the, the influx of children to that youth club in St. Joseph. Um, both, of, um, both Ms. Dikoto and Corporal Goddard are counselors, so they are engaged in conflict resolution as well as anger management lectures. They go to different schools, they are called upon. I think the court even recognizes the police youth club in St. Joseph as one of the places where they send children who are misbehaving as well. We also have children who are sent home from schools, who are sent on suspension. Um, an arrangement is made with the, with the principals and they go to that um, youth club where they receive counseling as well. So they are in fact working well with the other agencies as it relates to social, um, social development for these um, children and young people. The station council at Eastern Division, Sunny Grand, yes, especially most areas have a station council. And on that council will be made up of various persons from uh, um, other stakeholders. And similar to what is occurring by Mr. Smith, is also occurring in Eastern Division with the, we have homework centers, we have uh, the police youth club at Sunny Grande where the court refers children who are on suspension and other things. And there's a lot of other work that is being done. But if I may, I would like to ask Inspector Ragbir if he could. Um, how many police youth clubs you have in your division? Like, for example, your divisional commander, Northern Division Central, how many youth clubs you have? One or, or different youth clubs? Police youth clubs. Well, I have five youth clubs in my, in my division. Sir, I will good. good afternoon, ma'am. In the Eastern Division, each station district, there is a youth club in each station district. The, the, at the youth club, the station commander has the ultimate responsibility for the youth clubs, although they are officers who are assigned to the clubs. The youth clubs' activities in the station district, they are, we have sports, other cultural, um, music, dance, self-defense training in some of the youth clubs taking place. Another initiative with the youths in Eastern Division is the school liaison officer program. Within the schools within the Eastern Division, we assign officers to each school. So the officers have a mandate to visit the schools, conduct lectures, interact, so we sometimes refer to it as adopter school. I myself uh, is the school lease officer with one of the secondary schools in the Rio Claro district, where I would be involved in the training with the, cri the school cricket team and the football team. So this is what the station commanders are expected to lead by example. Valencia District is one of our most challenging station district in Eastern Division. And the community work that is done there, we saw a lot of improvement in Valencia. With the youth club in Valencia, together with the schools, the visits and the school leads or, or, um, programs in that district, we saw the improvement in Valencia. Matura is another station that there is tremendous work being done with the youths. San Gandhi is also, San Gandhi we have a vibrant youth club there. The courts generally when the, when juveniles are, the, one of the um, requisite um, for bail, they attend the youth club at San Gandhi, where area we call Brooklyn, that they would now um, have to report there as a condition of bail to be involved in some activities. So. That is what is happening in the Eastern Division with youths. And also we have the additional problem in Eastern where the squatting areas bring in fresh families. And as you would imagine a squatting area, you wouldn't have the amount of facilities of the other areas. So it is more important that in 
Eastern Division, we do more community work to try to get them from a young age. And that's why it is so important that we push community policing so much in Eastern Division. And I believe that may be the reason why we have had some successes in and, different um, areas. And um, um, also, do you all work closely with the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services? I know they have um, the district offices and welfare boards. Do you all have that sort of relationship with yes. the plastic, especially with those spotting communities? Yes. When we visit the areas, we do. Southern Division. Well, there's a new club in every policing district in the Southern Division, so it amounts to 10 new clubs that are active. We are involved in social programs such as and other uh, sporting activities such as football matches, hikes, and other, other, <coughs> other um, activities. Right, so the community policing section in, in, the, in the division is also active in monitoring the schools. In fact, we have on a daily basis school patrols being conducted. Also, the community policing section, they will visit the schools. Basically, they are assigned to specific schools in the division to counteract any form of indiscipline, they will take start. Also, I intend to have a stakeholder, stakeholder meetings with the social development agencies for these persons who are engaged in, I'll call them the windshield wipers at certain intersections on the highways. So that, that's an issue that came up in the, in the meeting. And Friday, I, I, I responded to that. So I, it's about giving an option. It's not about enforcement of the law, if it comes to that. So what I'm doing is taking down some names, and I'm going to get <coughs> involved with wherever training facilities to have these persons trained for meaningful employment. So that option that I am giving them, if that doesn't work, then we'll have to... I just want to commend you. That's really commendable, that you're you giving them much. that option and providing opportunity for them to receive training to take them out from something that might be dangerous and dangerous. somewhat illegal. So I want to commend you for Thank that. Thank you very much, ma'am. And the same, same applies to the persons who were seen begging, asking for arms with, with little children. There's the other project in mind that is by, on the highways too and by malls and shopping, other shop, shopping centers. So I will need the intervention of the other agencies, the social agencies, to help me with this project. Um, Mr. Chairman, that for other questions? Thank you, sir. Right. Um, Mr. Sudin, um, in one of your responses, you have mentioned that sexual offense is a problem in your division. Yes, ma'am. There are, there are several reports. I have the data here. And, oh. well, in 2023, sexual offenses, there was a number of 83 were reported. In 2024, so far for this year, 30 reports of sexual offences. What sort of, sort of strategies you all are employing to treat with that, to reduce the numbers? Uh, one of the strategies was the, the domestic awareness uh, drive we had in the Princess Down. Also, in our town meetings and walkabouts, we will engage the community. We have flyers. We will sensitize them on, on, on these issues. Through the station council, persons will also be engaged. So it's about sharing information with any with potential victims of these crimes. Divisional heads, <clears throat> personal experience on the ground. The police now, and it's a follow-up from Member Westeroy questions, um, have to now understand. <clears throat> root causes when you are when you are addressing your job as a police officer you, you can't just go offense punitive root cause are you all being trained now to at least are you training your junior officers relative to prepare them to address social issues because when you engage young people these days it's a different sort of engagement you know it's not the engagement that you would have a decade ago they are very much invested but they invested in a different Mode, do you have that training that deals with this issue that can prepare your officers to at least have an understanding of root causes when they approach young people with the, with the specific goal of the reduction of criminal activities in your communities? One person. Okay. Um. I remember a particular um, time when I was in the Central Division, 
we had Operation Steelgate in Enterprise. We had an explosion of violence in Enterprise in 2017. And um, when we injected police officers in that community, we had issues like that because we had several conflicts with the officers as it relates to interacting with members of the, um, the community. Yes. And we, we got some training for these officers because while we had community police, we used diff several different types of policing. Community police was one of it, intelligence-led and all, all these types. But when we had community policing building in one side, we had destruction on the other side because we had sometimes force, sometimes the attitude of the officers. Because remember, we were in a particular area where there was violence. So remember, the normal thing to do is go in there in a tough way. But when we realized that we were losing ground, these officers had to be trained in that regard. And they were in fact trained, we had the officers, and we, and we saw a huge difference as it relates to even the relationship between us and the members of the public in the enterprise district. It tempered down, and then the information started to flow, and we were even more successful at the end of the day with our, our operation in enterprise. So. Well, I know it was put in place at the level of the commissioner, right. and I have put it in place because I look badly because I am in charge of the North Central Divisions. So I've put it in place as well as <coughs> disciplinary procedures has already, already started as it relates to that. Do you understand, does the police understand the significance in this scenario, in this contemporaneous Trinidad and Tobago, of the importance of community police? Because, uh, for example, Carinage. What division is Carinage? Western Division. There's a, a, a real effort. You know, there's a state-of-the-art center for the, for the youth club. You know, state-of-the-art, yes. yes? Yes, sir. And when we go there on a weekly, twice a week, sometimes it seems that the community police is, let me use a proper word, the not-favored son, the prodigal son, why is the prodigal son was out, huh? not when he returned? The prodigal son of the police service, they send the vehicles late when they have to collect the meals for the children. What is being done to... And that program, I can tell you firsthand, is it's getting serious traction from the community up in Scorpio and Hague Street. You're seeing the children coming out. This week they unveiled a mural with the children signed with their... They, they signed both with their prints and their names. Are you all taking the, are you all understanding in terms of reduction of crime that if you can get that change in relationship between the police and the community, that that will lead to a reduction in crime in the community because we are seeing persons of interest come to the community center with their children, you know, to ensure that they do the right thing that they may not have done in their life. Are you all taking it seriously, or is it going to be, why is the prodigal son has not returned? Is, this, is it the prodigal son of the police service while he's out squandering his father, his, 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 his inheritance? Is that the approach? That is certainly not the approach of the police service. Um, at East San Division, that is why, as Inspector Aguirre spoke of earlier, we have in each community, the station commander is responsible for interacting with the children, with furthering youth clubs, with encouraging members to do things, taking part in school lectures. Even the gang unit at Eastern Division goes to the secondary school and conduct lectures on the dangers of gangs, talk to them about various activities that could lead them into problems. And, and, but you need to focus and channel some energies and some resources because what we are facing here is multifaceted, you know. It is. Multifaceted. And if you, if you could affect the impressionable minds and show them that they could come, they have confidence in the police service, that may be an immeasurable gain, just saying. Member Sukai. Thank you, Chair, and Chair Truyu. Good afternoon once more to everyone. Um, gentlemen, Commanders of Division, thank you again for being here to accept questions from this joint select. Um, I want to start off first by saying, as a former Chamber President, I work very closely with your Central Division's Senior Soup 
Um, I worked with several over time. I remember Mr. Ford, and then the last one in particular, now your deputy commissioner, uh, Mr. Kurt Simon, all right? I remember before Mr. Simon left, he set up the, um, the intelligence section there at Central Division, where I believe it was the pilot program, where screens and monitors were set up to do the camera monitoring because we assisted financially through the Chamber of Commerce to, to have that going and coming. So I know that the business community and you all work together hand in hand, I especially I know how Central Division works. Also, in that in those times, I would have seen three, four senior soups leave. So when Senator Lachmidiel was talking about that relationship being formed, you know, eventually you then break that and have to form a new relationship again with a new senior soup that comes in. I asked this question to the um, commissioner of police, and she was uh, indicating is how your rank and your hierarchy for you to for for um for you to gain your improvements or go up the chain, that's why they move you accordingly to division. Is it something that needs to be restructured in the constitution of the TTPS? Because you see that that one to one arrangement, that one to one um, relationship that you build over time for a community augurs well. Because that's where you see some senior soups that stayed for a very long period of time tend to have gained more success in terms of combating crime and getting to know the area. Is that something that constitutionally wise needs to be adjusted? It would be nice if it could be, but um, as you rightly said, due to promotion, due to retirement from the service, sometimes due to debt, unfortunately, we have officers have to be removed. Well, they would be removed from the division. And um, vacation leave, some people have to go on vacation leave because of the amount that we amass. And um, you know, we have to put other persons in place to replace them. So it's just a matter of that. It's not anything spiteful. It's something that we wish we could leave it, you know, because there's several um, foundations that we have built, and we lose it. And then for another person to go and start over, right? It, it, it's quite, and what it does as well is it shakes that division to the foundation, you know, because the persons are unsettled because another senior comes, and his style might be different from the first one. And, and so, so it goes, and we have unsettled officers. So it's something that we can look at. Yeah, it's something that we need because that relationship and that bond built over time. I mean, you, yes. if it's not working, it's not working, but sometimes it works. However, it, it, it gets me into the, the meat of my, my, um, my question. And, um, can, by division then, can you give us an indication of home invasions in each one of your division? Like, what are the numbers like? Because we have been seeing a lot especially in the news, social media, about several home divisions. Do you all have those figures right now that you can bring to us and present what um, percentage or if it's by numbers of home invasions you're currently experiencing? And then maybe based it on last year's figures around the same time? I'll go first with the North Central Division. Um, when you say the term home invasions, we look at burglaries or breakings. Sometimes we have persons at home when these incidents occur, or some people are not at home. But your privacy is invaded, so we, we lump it now as home invasions, right? So for a North Central Division, for 2024, we, 2023, we had 43 burglary slash breakings, or what you would call home invasions. This year, we have 53. Now, we have a problem in Aruka District at this stage, and it's flowing over to Tunapuna. So it's a close um, borderline. Um, I have my officers actively I'm working to find this suspect. I spoke about that suspect who we identified through video footage or who we saw in our video footage. We have not been able to identify him as yet. We have been seeking assistance of members of the public to identify him. This video has been circulated to all our chat groups, all the officers in our division, as well as the other chat groups in other division. We are trying to locate this person. With the arrest of this man, we would be able to bring down the amount of um, burglary breakings. So it's not the, the, the type of home invasion where you see um, a group of men entering a, a home and robbing persons beating in some instances, but it's a single person going into the homes in this instance. To a lesser extent, we have the group of men going into homes in our division. What about the other division commanders? 
Right, for what, what figures I have before me um, to share, um, the burglaries and breakings, I have a period, January 1st to March 25th, 23 versus 24. So for the corresponding period, um, well, last year we had 41, and for this year we had 25. Any others? Yes, so for the um, Southern Division, there were 54 burglaries for 2023, uh, January to March. For this year, 37. So there is a reduction, also a 31% reduction. Added to that, there were six uh, persons arrested for what I will term home invasion, going straight into the home invasion. They committed the act and they were held soon after by the quick response by the police. And they are before the courts. Also, in one of those suspects, true fingerprint, he gave a wrong name, but true fingerprint, he was traced, his real identity was revealed, and he was traced to another robbery, home invasion with a large supermarket owner. So that, that was solved, and since that, we, we have seen a reduction in the home invasion itself. So then that leads me to my another question is that you have the victims and even the general citizenry. What is, do you all track the response time? Say they call and they call the station. What is the response time to get to these individuals and how, how quick it is? Do you have, have any metrics to track that? I will say the response time is, is prompt response as practical, but with but the size of the division sometimes, you might get a call, let's say, I'll use gas. Let's say average. So you're looking at a, a general average, and so today you'll have to, I know you'll say, uh, the, the, the for distance. distance. With the resources, I will say five to 10 minutes response time. So then in terms of working vehicles per, per division, then how many vehicles do you have working, and do you have adequate amount of vehicles now, given that, um, resources have been provided to the TTPS to upgrade your current cadre of fleet of vehicles. Is it that you are comfortable now and that is why you are able to respond quicker? At present, sir, in the Southern Region, we have 23 working vehicles, so we vehicles out of a fleet of 41. We have 21, but however, uh, we will be resourceful in that during the night where a vehicle might be attached to an office during the day we will use those vehicles to augment our patrols and exercises during the night. That'll be for your division and the other divisions. Are you comfortable or could you give us an idea of the figures that you have? Okay, um, for North Central Division, and I just want to say something in, re in relation to the response. The response time to these crimes would vary. Now, when we have home invasions where persons have been tied up in their homes, it's only when they get a chance to lose themselves, then they'll be able to call the TTPS and make their reports. Does, it's only then we can respond. So we may have an hour, we may have two hours after the crime has been committed when people um, make the calls. So to say response time, to give a specific response time as it relates to those type. Then as we said before, the home invasions would include when you are home or when you're not home. When you're not home, you secure your house at 6 a.m. and you return at 5 p.m. after working, you discover your house broken into. That is when you make the report. That is probably when this suspect is long gone. This is where we have the scientific approach, CCTV cameras as well, ICT as well as I see witnesses who may have seen these persons. As it relates to my vehicles, I am quite satisfied with the vehicles that I have at this stage. Uh, we are in fact deploying them effectively in the division. And um, you know, some of them break down at times because it is not the same extrail that you may have. We have the same extrail in fact, but the usage is quite different. So we need to do some modifications on these vehicles because it's 24 seven we are working these vehicles whereas a private citizen will use their vehicle two or three hours in traffic and park it. We use it 24-7. Would it be, I mean, I know, me, I'm, I know mechanicals. Yes. Would it be the usage or would it be the maintenance of it? Because no, we have, proper maintenance, right? you could avoid that. Yes. And that, that would go to some of the service providers as well. And maintenance, we do maintenance as we are scheduled. But we also have some of the vehicles, they have reached their time. Eh? We have extrails that are about 12, 13 years old. We have vehicles that are not really suited for policing. So for instance, these Suzuki's problems, overheating problems all the time. Is that brought forward to your procurement agency, your procurement agent when you are then going out for procurement so that you ensure that you have fit for purpose vehicles now? Right, and this is what we bring to them because it's after the fact we learn these. After they purchase these Suzuki's, I would say, 
then we learn about the, the, the problems when we start to use them. Currently, we have a problem with some of the vehicles, brand new vehicles, where we have the, 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 the eradicator who's um, rupturing. Brand new vehicles. And these are the Santa Fe's and they, and they have to be put down, otherwise we'll mash up the engines. You go straight back to the procuring um, entity, right? To yes, make and sure this, has, that this has been uh, reported to them. All right, yes. and then tie back to then, uh, so, so far you seem to be addressing the home invasion in, in a very more a scientific and systematic way, yes. I believe. Yes. Now, coming back to, to the, the sense that the population is feeling, because they still are uh, uneasy given that, you know, these perpetrators are out there, these bandits are out there and basically lurking. Do you target the areas by zoning to see which are the potential areas that have home invasions or have frequency of home invasions so that you have extra patrols on these streets and then you are manning and, and talking to the, the community itself? Do you do things like these to ensure that the commu that community in particular that is facing these hardship that they are aware and that you all are somewhere close by or have satellite branch so that you could access, access them quickly? Uh, if I could just add to that question, Chairman, please. Because, Member Sukai asked a very important question and your response just now was that the only time you can respond is when the persons who have been held, held up in their homes are able to free themselves to call the police. And there was a highly publicized case a couple of months ago, weeks ago, where the person was saying that, and I've heard other reports like this, that someone is outside my house. They are trying to get in to rob me. It is urgent. And there's no response for hours, if at all. So that is a scenario that's taking place that is in contrast to what you are seeing in terms of the people wanting a response when there is, and there's a video I saw last week actually, where the perpetrators were in the yard and the uh, people got up, they were stealing the car and they're saying, go inside, I will shoot here. Go back inside, no police ain't coming now. That is a scenario that's very, uh, in terms of people's mindset out there. So we're looking at time for response. Now, we're looking at the time because we want to finish in about 15 minutes. So give us a crisp response, please. Could you just add to that and address uh, why else you at it? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'll tell you after. Sorry, but you as well. Um, several reports and things on social media about people calling 999 because, look, I don't know the number for uh, police station off the top of my head, but I could dial 999. And people actually commenting, recording, putting it out there that when they call 999, they're being put on hold. Um, is that a challenge that you face as well and will obviously affect your response time? And what has led to that issue? Because I don't remember in years gone by, 999 being something like KFC or something where they put you on hold to take your order. Let's go with a brief answer. I want to go to Member Mitchell after. Okay, to, to quickly um, respond. Now, I said in some instances, persons will only be able to make reports when they are, are able to untie themselves. Now, when we have persons calling and, and giving information that persons are in the yard, the correct thing to do is for the police to respond. However, we have certain challenges that maybe the officers may be facing. For instance, if there are an, another call for service elsewhere and they have to deal with a particular issue and then respond, then we will have the distance as Mr. Sudin will have that challenge as to reaching the area because of the wide expanse of his division. So we also, as it relates to Mr. Sukai's um, uh, question, we are also actively involved in assessing our, our crimes and the district where the crime occur. We also have zoning in all the, the station divisions. Uh, all the divisions, sorry, we have zoning. So our patrols are patrolling the zones as required. And um, Mom spoke, what, what was Mom question? About the same, it's, it's the same, same line. Same thing, right? Yes. So, yes, so more or less we, we observe our trends and patterns. We have in our division as well as Northern Division, I know, we started preparing um, our patrol brief on a bi-weekly basis. All our commanders are aware of every single thing that is taking place in their division on a bi-weekly basis. So we are able to assess it bi-weekly and they are properly able to deploy their resources accordingly to what the crimes that are taking place. But Mitchell. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, good afternoon again. Um, in January of this year, we had an interaction with the Commissioner of Police where the matter of the body cameras came up. Um, and the commissioner indicated that it was a clear case of officers not following the instructions. So as the divisional 
commanders, can you tell us, can you confirm for us that you have, in fact, instructed? Well, give us a, an overview of what is the situation right now with the body cameras and what is your position on the instruction for officers to wear body cameras in the line of duty? Shishad or Khan, we want an answer from yeah, this. I, mean, I guess we'll start this way, right? Yeah. I take an answer. We have, in Eastern Division, we have 66 functional cameras. We have 11 at Sunny Grandi. 15. We're talking about body cameras. Yeah. Body, body cameras. Yeah, yes. body cams. Yeah, body cams, yeah. Right. Yeah. So we have a total of 66. Instructions are given to, well, we look at the frontline officers, like the task forces, the CID officers on patrol and so on, that they are to wear the body cams. And from time to time, we would check to see that that instructions is being carried out. You would get resistance at times because I would suggest that sometimes a new technology come in play and a new culture is forming where persons have to start to get accustomed to something. And I, well, for, if it is now introduced to, to, an, to an officer, to him it is new. But it's a lawful instruction. Right, so that is if why. If there is any agency mm -hmm. that ought to persecute and prosecute a charge for disobedience of a lawful instruction, mm -hmm. it ought to be the police service. It is. And, and that is why, Chair, Chair, I said that um, the instructions are given, and from time to time, we would check to make sure that that instruction is being carried out. If it is not being carried out, the line supervisor is required to serve the officer with a notice, and we will follow the disciplinary process. Member Mitchell? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's go, because I mean, it, it leads into some other questions that I have regarding discipline. Right, so I am very high, my, my administration is very high on discipline, myself, Mr. Carty, and Mr. Pitt, and um, he has a nickname because of that, and um, I'm saying that as recently as Monday, um, I would have given instructions for every officer um, to whom the body worn camera is issued is to wear it, and the SDO in charge is to give me a weekly report as to whether the officers are following my instructions or not. If they are not, of course, disciplinary proceedings are instituted, and Mr. S Mr. Carty will be the disciplinary officer. But when they're wearing it, of course, yes. it's not just wearing it. You have to ensure it on, that yes. it's on and right. it captures video. And there was, and one, and there was one difficulty um, in terms of the, the, last, the, the time that the battery lasts, an hour and a half. <coughs> but patrols are usually over an hour and a half, and they say that the battery runs down. However, that is not an issue for us. I told them, put it on, let the battery run down. At least you have done what you're supposed to do. Hold on, and, and uh, no, the committee, listen, there's a, there, there's a collective side here. Resources are employed to purchase these body cameras to be worn, yes? You know it's a first line protection for your officers against allegations of excessive police force and wrongdoing? You know that, right? Yes. It's by no means novel. My respectful advice, just enforce it. The, the, the batteries, the right now, the batteries, when they're on their way to the site, right, the batteries do have to be on, you know, for the hour, so that wouldn't be part of the hour and a half life of the battery. But when they come out of the vehicle and they're in hot pursuit, the battery is on. You can have more than one battery, right? In a perfect world, yes. respectfully. Um, an officer might have the presence of mind when he's going into an engagement or an, an action to, to switch on a camera. Some of our officers don't have that presence of mind and they don't do it. So I, I told them, for me, put it on. Because you don't want to use that excuse that I was too excited to put on the camera. Wow. Put it on. Wow. Mitchell, you go right ahead. I will turn my mic. You, you answered? No, I, I, I haven't answered. My division, we have 66 um, body cams. They are distributed throughout all the stations as well as our task force. They have been instructed and they are adhering to the instructions. Yes, yes sir. Um, in Southern Division, there are 60 body cameras. However, three is not <coughs> um, malfunction at this time. 57 operational. They are assigned to specific officers in the task force who are instructed to wear. Also, for enforcement, I want to put on an extra layer that I want to communicate directly where the images are being loaded to find out the, the time, the time 
each camera was, was used. Right? And, um, but to answer the question about the batteries, I, my understanding of it is that when it's put to charge, that is when the recorded time is downloaded, is during the charging process. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, let me, let me just go on quickly, because we're limited on time now. Um, I want to address the matter of discipline with your officers. Um, I think the police service, they have a challenge. You all have a challenge with your image. And part of it has to do with um, distrust. And the distrust because of errant officers and you know, general indiscipline. How do you deal with establishing and maintaining the rule of law within the police service? The chair spoke about training as it relates to the generation that we're dealing with now. And likewise, we have to be specially equipped. It may not be training to deal with the officers that we have nowadays, right? It takes a lot, but we have to deal with them. So when all else fails, we speak with them, we call them, I mean, we have errant officers who take another sick leave, right, who just stay away from work, all these things. When we, all else fails with that, we move to the disciplinary process, and that is done. Now, as a tribunal officer, I, I wouldn't comment much on, you know, on certain issues, but the fact is the disciplinary process is alive in all divisions. All senior superintendents are the tribunal officers for the special reserve, and our superintendents are the tribunal officers for the regular police officers, and it is alive and it is well. Well, as a, as a tribunal officer, as a tribunal officer, perhaps you can tell us, let's say within the last five years, would you say that there are more disciplinary matters on performance or conduct coming to you all to treat with? Yes, I, I would take the liberty to answer this one because... And just give us the rate of in, increase yeah, just, or decrease. Just prior to coming to the Southern Division, I was attached to the Police Complaints Division, where I was the tribunal chairman in that division. And I could safely say every single day for the last two years, there were matters before that tribunal for disciplinary hearings and ongoing. So I have a lot of matters still. I was even, I even made the comment that the departmental order 14 of 2008, well, it was written in 2008, and things have changed since then in terms of discipline. So there, there are a number of matters before the disciplinary tribunal. For last year, any complaints, there were over 1,000 reports all wouldn't make it to the, the tribunal. But out of that 1,000 reports, a significant number will be referred to the tribunal for, for hearings. Okay. So I'm moving on quickly. So moving away from that, I would ask, I would ask that you mention something about matters in the court and the court granting bail where, in your opinion, bail should not be granted. Do you have any data to support that? And on the next occasion, or when you go away, can you supply us with that data? Because we saw some, I believe it was Kamala Prasad Bisesa complaining in the newspaper that a specific master of the court was giving bail when bail really ought not to have been given. Do you, the police service, do you keep data, records of those situations? Yes, we, that record could be obtained and supplied today. This um. Thank you very much. With respect to the larceny of motor vehicles, in today's, with today's technology, why is this still an issue? And what do you have to say to the public, or have you been communicating to the public to, in, you know, outside of armed robbery, what do you have to say to the public in terms of minimizing the larceny of motor vehicles? Because we know serious crime, we have two ingredients, vehicle and gun. Okay, larceny motor vehicles as well as robberies of vehicles. Now, we have both of them. The larceny motor vehicle, you park, you leave, and you return and your car stolen. Robbery, they take it when they realize it's a hard target, they take it from you by gunpoint. Now, we have a lot of technology, as you said, some people not utilizing it because they believe that it cannot happen to them. So what we have to say to the members of the public, we realize it's a, it's, it's a serious crime that is taking place throughout the country. 
and it's being used to commit crimes, murders, all different types of serious crimes. Please put some security devices on your vehicles. Be aware of your surroundings. We know there are a lot of persons who have to park on the roadway because they have no other parking facilities at their homes, but they have to put some security devices on their vehicles. It would assist us, this, the, the um, car search, you know, this GPS system would you assist us greatly. You have a little Apple thing that they sell and you could just chuck yeah. it in the exactly. car. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But then everything that, uh, a lot of things that they have, the criminals have something to counteract, counteract it. We also see that some of the criminals are using um, code catching devices right. to capture your code when you, when you, when you press your, um, your, your um, immobilizer. So all these things we are advising members of the public. We do it on Beyond the Tape, we do it on several other platforms to advise members of the, the public as well as our town meetings, station council, all these things, chats as well. So we in fact advise members of the public of these precautions. The last thing, and this is not a question, this is a commendation, which appears to be one of the most commonsensical thing that the police have done. Where you are looking at social media and you are seeing people identifying themselves as gang members and simply just arresting them and put them before the court. I want to really commend you on that and perhaps you all should track social media because people are openly declaring themselves as gang members, openly showing all their illicit, illegal firearms, demonstrating gang life, and I want to commend you for that, and I hope that you do keep it up, and we see more of these arrests coming, you know, in the days and months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Mitchell. Now, members, we are going to have a, another round of questioning. Your answers ought to look at the time. Crisp your answers, and we start with Member Munilal. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just in less than one minute, I can ask this question. In my first round of question, and I raised the issue of strength, and all the divin divisional leaders re replied with the human resource issue. Now, I would like to raise the issue of resources, equipment, and so on. We receive requests from police officers, and it is not my intention to call police officer name or station name and so on, we're not into that. But we requ police often make requests for some of the basic equipment, basic things. There's a situation one month ago or so, where a police officer actually asked from a police station, which we can name after, to help to print a report, to print a statement outside the police station because the printer is not working. Ask for ink, ask for paper. I can think of other resources and so on, but I wanted to get an impression from these divisional leaders. What is the situation with such basic resources that may or may not be available to stations that members of the public business community, MPs, ask? And the other matter, I just want to confirm for the record because something slipped during Mr. Mitchell's presentation. The body cameras, we have now the body cams. You're saying that the charge for one hour, one and a half, more or less, but of course an operation is longer than an hour, one and a half. Uh, um, the battery lasts for an hour, hour and a half, I'm told. But is it that the, char the chargers are in place now that all the divisions have chargers, so when this battery goes down after an hour and a half, presumably it can be recharged quickly? We want to be absolutely clear on that at this time. And of course, my first question was a resource question where I, I tell you a fact that someone, the police ask someone to actually help to print a statement that the person was right, um, had to do. I can go on with that. But Mr. Montrichard, do not follow the example of Member Munilal. Be short in your response, please. Very short and sweet. Um, the charger is located at the station. If you're outside, you can only charge it when you come back to the station. And two, we do have issues with getting um, ink, toner, those small items from time to time. As recently as last week, to do a, a, um, a walkabout, we had to use the inspector's cash, his cash, personal cash, to print flyers for the public to use, because we didn't have ink. Lutch Media. Well, <clears throat> Member Lutch Media, I'll ask your question, please. Um, run very quickly. One person answer, <laughs> please. So the most appropriate person answer. Southern Division, that's where I'm concerned about. What's the role of the divisions um, and then as divisional commanders in terms of the speedy processing of FUL applications from members of the public who wish to acquire firearms for personal protection? 
the, the application will come by us for investigation and in division, but final approval is given by the Commissioner of Police after the investigation, please. Thank you, Member Sukai. Um, thank you again, Chair. Quick question. Are your vehicles currently equipped with GPS? And if they are, are they tracked at the command center so that you can inform your dispatchers if there's a situation whether or not the vehicle is in close proximity of where the incident took place? Because I think that is the only way that you'll be able to provide a rapid response when it comes to incidents. So do you have GPS for functioning in, in, your, um, in all your vehicles right now? We have GPS systems on the vehicles, but some of them are not installed as yet. The new vehicles that we just got do not have them, and they are being acquired now to uh, install them. But the majority that we had existing before have them. And you're monitored at the station? They are monitored at the um, OCC, our operational command center. Not your local station? No, not our local station. We don't have that. We have our um, operation centers, each division, and they do the monitoring, not each station. So when they call, uh, someone has a problem, and they call, they call the station, it, it goes to you, you all lays with the national operation to find out pro proximity of where the vehicle is? Yes. Um, when reports go in more, so to the 999. Right. That um, um, information is, is related to the vehicles on the outside on patrol. Um, the, our regional OCs also receive the information. And they, too, are able to relate with the vehicles on the streets. And that vehicle and also has GPS, right? These, those have um, GPS. So they can track them and see where they are. And we Thank can you. also pull up where they have been through our um, and get the history from So them. you could say why sometimes they take two, three hours to arrive at scenes? We, we, if we have to do an investigation, we can pull up that and, and, and have it. Member Richards. Thank you, Chairman. Just a comment on the, many of you mentioned the issue of culture, and you would have identified yourselves as being new to divisions. As a, an academic involved in psychology, there's no behavior change without consequences, just a suggestion. The question has to, the, my question follows Member Mitchell's line of questioning re, regarding the commendable arrests that have been made based on persons posting on social media. And if you do research on any article on new frontiers in crime fighting and poli policing, you will see that a lot of emphasis is being placed in police jurisdictions around the world on digital and social media because criminals, like everyone else, are now living in the digital realm, including understanding that their phones are being tracked in some instances and they're being monitored on phones. So they have moved their communication modalities to online coding messages on TikTok, coding messages on WhatsApp, coding messages on Facebook and all of that. Is there, the question is, is there and I know there's the police, TTPS, cybercrime unit involved in their own work. Is there additional training being done by the TT police service in your divisions so officers have the expertise to look at these messages and monitor these uh, transmissions from persons of interest with a view to helping to solve crimes and bring these perpetrators to justice because that is their new realm of communication. Yes, sir. We do have that type of analysis taking place. It is not limited to the divisions. Um, we recognize that there are a lot of things that persons would learn and based on that there would be some change in behavior and also change in terms of their methods of approach. So there's some dynamics, so to speak, regarding when we would gain some success and if we could continue along that trajectory, the levels of success that we may experience. So to answer your question directly, yes, it is existing. Uh, and we are also looking at other avenues by which to be um, on top of things and not necessarily having to play catch up. Are you into algorithms following those trends on social media yet? Yes, I, I have been told, I have been informed by um, various um, analysts that algorithms are used in addition to other forms of um, technology and, and, and systems. 
um, you would appreciate the fact that there's a lot that we would not be able to mention at this particular point in time. But where that is concerned, we are satisfied that we are in a good place. Mr. Roy. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have one question for each officer, but it's no. the same. My question is, what will you commit to doing differently or better within your division to improve policing and the police service? 30 seconds, every member. Divisional head. Um, I would like to do better at communicating with the public, and I'm engaging them and building that relationship. I think that is the key to going forward. Every, every divisional commander, I believe, will benefit from connecting better with the public so that we could be, build relationships, share information, and get the job done together. Yes, I totally agree with that. My, uh, my focus is on community engagement as we go forward and fight against crime. Strengthen community engagements as well as operations. I would like to see that um, we work closer with the community to build the trust issue that we need to bridge that trust. gap because if we don't bridge that gap, no matter how hard we work, we can't get it done alone. You know that part of the percentage of the trust in the police force, we did the last, our last report, and trust is at its lowest. Remember Mitchell? Now he has ceded his, he has mortgaged his question to me and I accept the mortgage. Tell me something. $2.9 billion in the national budget has been allocated to the police service alone, or the 4.5% of the national budget. Do you think that the police service is utilizing that resources optimally? $2.9 billion, I've just checked it. That's the, of the national budget, that's the estimate that's allocated to the police service. Are you all utilizing that resource? Are you? Optimally. Or how could it be used? We want to reduce crime. And at the level of the Comstat, is where decisions are made sometimes, right? And we yes. understand what is going on. In every organization, you could always do better. Right. And I would agree that we could do better, but Things don't happen overnight, and we are working in, as in Eastern Division, we are seeing successes. And if you or a lot of the other division, they are also seeing success. So I'm saying, yes, we could do better, but I'm saying also that we are utilizing the resources in a good place. Tell us, I've seen four divisional heads here. We're dealing with the reduction of crime. I know that your head is uh, female. Are there no female divisional heads? Not that Webster Roy, you have a question. No, no, go ahead. No, you go ahead and ask the question. Not at this stage, probably because of promotion, they have not been to the rank, as well as, as well as, but however, we have some of them in sections because of their rank. Well, well, but we that see is none because they were all, but none, they were but all none, promoted. none are divisional heads. But that's all right. Now, as we are about to close, um, I want to go into overtime because this is a very significant engagement. Member Webster Roy, one more question. Yes, ask them. Ask why. Why are there no divisional heads who are female Females. Yeah. in order to help solve crime? At this stage, there are no um, female um, senior officers who are at the rank to go as a, a divisional commander. They would only go there if, they reached, if it reaches them for the acting appointment as a senior <coughs> superintendent. However, we have them at section commanders. For instance, Act we have Ms. Garland at um, the, the child, child Protection Unit as well. Member Richards. What? What is done is when you analyze your performance quarter by quarter and you do not make the targets because we've had presentations for a number of years now. To be fair, Mrs. Hewitt Christopher is commissioner for just over a year. But we, we make presentations about targets. They're, they're broadcast. The public hears the targets, and then the targets are not met. Fortunately, some of the divisional targets have been met today and comm commendations to that. But particularly in those areas where the three top uh, levels of crime are taking place. What is done differently in terms of understanding where you fell short and making a strategic change in direction
to accomplish the targets or to change the trends. Member Montrichard, go ahead. Well, that we, we do a review um, every quarter um, based on the, with the crime and problem analysis branch. And they indicate to us what our weaknesses are, where we need to buck up, um, what are the trends, what we are not doing right, what we need to do better. And based on their analysis, we take advice and we adjust our um, strategies to suit. That's the best answer I can give you because that's what we do. Mr. Sukai. Do Dr. Richards, if I may. To achieve targets, the targets in Eastern Division, each station commander, we have a WhatsApp chat with each station commander on that chat. We, on a daily basis, we know what each station is doing. The other, every weekly, we have weekly meetings with the station commanders and we analyze the data and work together to achieve the targets. If the targets is not met within the timeline, we then go back and prioritize our strategies, strategy, strategy initiatives to implement and bring about that change. What are you going to ask? What are the biggest challenges you have in achieving those targets, Mr. Montchard? Um, the challenges are varied. You have internal issues and you have external issues. Um, I think we, we, we went into the, some of the external issues already in terms of the sheer um, number of persons we have to service and the, the number of persons we have to do the service. Um, we have the issue of culture. We have the issue of persons not willing, most times, to come and assist the police with the information we are going to need for obvious reasons, trust and building that relationship and so on. So those are the realities. Um, persons sometimes are willing, sometimes they are not. And because we have this gang culture, and you spoke about it when you opened, um, the heinous nature of the, the crimes that take place, persons are less inclined um, to come forward and give the assistance that we need. Mr. Sukai. Thank you, Chair and Chair Truyu. Um, I'm happy to see that TTPS uh, embracing technology to a certain extent. But you know, this thing about receipt books or not having receipt books, do you think it's time we look at digitizing that process to make it a little more efficient for the population so that they will know, you know, this paper basis start eliminating, at least for those who can access the digital, which is almost 90%, start digitizing the process? We have started. And how far is the rollout? We have a pilot project, it's um, Maloney. A direct entry reporting and St. Clair Police Station. We and the app, what is going on with the app? Uh, the the TTPS, TTPS app. app. It's, it's there. Member Lutch Media, member, member Sukai. <laughs> wow. Well, last occasion we heard the app wasn't functioning because of cost and that they were looking at it again. But anyway, my question, question no, no, that's not my okay. question. Anyway, my question is um, what is the success rate in terms of the project? Eagle Eye that you're talking about is success rate in terms of getting evidence retrieved from the CCTV camera network that you are implementing in different areas, getting it admitted into evidence. Have you actually had a, uh, a case where you've actually been able to um, admit the, the uh, CCTV footage into evidence? Project Eagle Eye was only launched on the 7th of March. This is our third week. Um, we have picked up um, footage that we can use in court. However, we have not reached to that stage yet to admit them in court. Thank you very much. Um, officers, a couple of years ago, a vehicle of mine was involved in an accident, hit and run, somebody hit the vehicle and so on. And I was very confident that the culprit will be found, given the amount of CCTV cameras in the vicinity. I was told by the police that none of those cameras were working. I wanted to get an assessment of what is the situation now with CCTV cameras across the board. Uh, to your knowledge, how much percentage-wise that is might be working and non-functional? Well, I certainly can't respond to that at this stage, but we will provide that in writing. In writing, we'd, we'd look forward. Now, as we close, is the police going to use the technology available to it, along with the legislation? You know that you have the miscellaneous um, Administration of Justice Act, which allows you to use CCTV footage. Things that have been acquired via technology. You have the Interception of Communication Act. You have the DNA legislation, the Electronic Monitoring Act. How is the police service going to utilize these modern techno technological initiatives to reduce crime and bring some relief to Trinidad and Tobago? 
the police service uses every means that it can to gather evidence to prosecute matters from time to time. And I see we have a cyber unit from time to time. If we need information on uh, footage, uh, phones, interrogation of phones, and a lot of other things, we go through there. So we are embracing technology. And we also have properly qualified persons in the service who can do the service. And training is being done from time to time. So I think we have embraced it. Member Mitchell. Yeah, very quickly. Um, you indicated that you would supply some information with respect to bail being given when it, in your view, it ought not to be given. Can I also ask, and this is for the police service, um, can, you, can I also ask whether you can give us some suggestions with respect to the legislation and how it can be amended to eliminate incidences like that? Thanks. It may require constitutional amendments, but we, we would need that in writing from your, from, your legal, from your legal department, because this committee would want to consider it. Because if recidivism is a roadway towards crime and the increase in crime, and granting of bail contributes to recidivism in that the perpetrator who has a previous conviction is granted bail that you think is unusually low or unusually reasonable or, un or unreasonably low, then you would need to tell us so that we can make a recommendation on your behalf, bearing in mind, of course, the Bail Act and, of course, the court's pronouncements on the Bail Act in Mandata Singh and Felicia Constantine, etc. Yes? yes? Now, as we are about to close, we would want very, very brief closing remarks from each of the divisional commanders, starting with Mr. Sudin. Well, good afternoon again, and um, thanks for having me here this afternoon. As a divisional commander of the Southern Division, it is my, my drive, my focus to keep on the reduction of violent crimes, all other crimes in the Southern Division while it's working in partnership with the, with the communities. Thank you very much. Yes, so good afternoon to the panel here assembled. Uh, my commitment is to do the best that I can with the resources that I have. But I'm still maintaining that my foundation is going to be my interaction with the public and crafting solutions together. Good evening to the panel and to the listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, my commitment is to the North Central Division as, and the police service on a whole to continue our fight against crime, to um, bring back our country, our beloved country, to a state of normalcy where we can all enjoy what we deserve in this country. Thank you very much. I would like to encourage members of the public to have trust in the police, work closely with your divisional station, and let us do and work together to bring back Trinidad and Tobago. To where we're supposed to be. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee and National Security, we are very grateful for your attendance this afternoon. We think that this session was very informative, it was very interactive, and I don't think subject maybe to one answer which you said you will give us in writing. Every question posed to you officers will answer and answer in an intelligent way, in a way that the public could understand and that we could understand. Now, there are areas, um, the divisional head of North 27 HDC houses, that, that's a serious area. You need to focus proactive. You know that that area may require more vehicles, but then when you go to Eastern, that's a vast area of expanse, yes? It's called the stretch, I'm told. We, we, I don't know, I, I don't have the solution, but you need to be thinking about it as if you're doing a case day and night until it's finished, because this is a case that we're doing now in Trinidad and Tobago. Crime is like a case need to address it until we have solved the case. Right now we have not solved the case. And the 
country. If you look at our carnival experience, Member Mitchell, it was a very decent experience. But we need, we need to get an arrest on crime. We need to get an arrest on crime, and we depend on you and your officers to arrest crime. On behalf of the committee, we would like to thank you for your attendance, and suffice it to say that we will be doing an audit, and when needs be, the committee will decide and ask you to come back before us to keep the public abreast. Do we have the assurance, divisional heads, that you all will be very robust and have a, without a very serious approach to crime in Trinidad and Tobago and criminal activity. Do we have that as a commitment from you as divisional heads? Yes, yes sir. Thank you very much. I will now adjourn this, I will suspend the sitting and the public hearing and we thank you for your attendance. Ah, pull up one of something now.